Hey, this is Michael Lindsay from Vital MX, and today we are taking a first look at the all-new Yamaha YZ450F, the 2023 model. This is a new generation bike for Yamaha. Uh, the last generation bike ran from 2018 to 2022. That was a five-year model cycle. It had a host of updates throughout it, but that is still a generation bike. Uh, five years is very common for a lot of the Japanese OEMs, four to five years or so on a model run, where we see KTM and the Austrian little trio tend to run around a three-year model cycle. So this is about what we expected. We've been awaiting this new Yamaha 450. For those asking already, no, the YZ250F did not change. Yamaha sometimes does them at the same time, um, but the last generation they had done the 250 year after the 450, so we probably won't see these same style updates um, on the 250 until next year. So the main target goals they claim with this bike were a lot of rider-centric items, basically improving the rider's connection to the bike, improving the rider triangles with the rider comfort, just how they stand on the bike, their stance, how they connect with it, where their grip points are, all those things, trying to make the bike a bit more nimble. We had heard from one or two guys that have had the opportunity to test this bike in pre-development or some race team development that were, weren't able to say much, but one of their biggest comments was, the nimble and lighter feeling of the bike. Actually, a big part of that is they do have a five pound weight reduction, which is really big for Yamaha, because I believe going into this, they were the second heaviest 450. The only thing heavier was the Suzuki RMZ 450. So this weight reduction should bring them down to the level about where the Kao and Honda are. And then the KTM gained weight this year. So I think it's still a tick lighter than those kind of group, but they've all kind of close, kind of cinched up on weight. A lot of this weight reduction will be from the engine, because if you look, KTM has made it shown really well that the big difference between a 250 and a 450 is the engine weight, and they've been able to get their 450 engine weights really close to their 250, so that's why you usually see a pound or two difference between a 250 and a 450 with them, where your Japanese OEMs like your Honda, your Yamaha, uh, Cowie have bikes that are very similar in design, sometimes the frame, same frames and bodywork, but 450s weigh massively more because of the engine. So most of what Yamaha's done here is to try to gut that 450 engine weight out of this thing and also change a host of things on the engine to improve the power, which may sound crazy because <laughs> Yamaha 450 already has a lot of power, but they've tried to do a few things to broaden the power range, um, try to get a little bit more torque down low than they already have. They've raised the, raised the rev ceiling by 500 RPM, so they've definitely allowed it to pull a little bit higher for those that like to really stretch out the power in each gear. And then there's also a host of electronic updates. So starting off with the engine, they claim a complete redesign for 2023. And it does look like so. The cases are definitely very different. The oil passages they actually switched from a wet sump to a dry sump lubrication, which means typically there must be an oil tank external somewhere on this bike. That usually means they're lowering the amount of oil directly in the engine and are changing it to an outboard system. Uh, we don't, just from the photos we've seen, we don't know where that would be on the bike, um, but that's just usually what that terminology means. They've also changed the head. It's probably, the head itself externally looks pretty similar. It does have new exhaust and intake ports. It does have larger diameter titanium intake valves, new piston design, new cylinder body, and then all new crankshaft with a different balancer assembly to match whatever they've done to the crank. So they're probably trying to change, again, the rotational output of this engine, changing where the power is and just, their claim combined effects here is mostly towards mid-range and top end power, again, stretching out the entire usability of each gear. Also noted again is that 500 higher RPM rev limiter, giving the engine, as they claim, a more linear output characteristics. Again, the power just stretches out farther. Uh, what's funny is typically when an OEM does something like this, it almost can make the bike feel slower because the power continues on at such a consistent level, very electric feeling, that some people misdiagnose or misidentify the power and they'll think, oh, the bike's slower because it feels smoother because it doesn't have these gaps and valleys through the power band, um, which honestly makes the bike faster, easier to ride, etc. So a big one they've done to shrink the overall case and engine size, you'll see behind the clutch cover, there's kind of no back of the case. It's because they have changed the transmission uh, to what they call a tri-shaft transmission. It is stacked vertically, so instead of the shafts being parallel, they basically stack them vertically in the motor, uh, raising the center shaft, and really just changing again how everything is laid out in the engine cases and be able to shrink the cases and kind of bring a little bit better center of gravity to that motor. There is an all-new clutch design on this bike for those that are worried they're going away from cable, including Mr. Eli Tomac. No, it still has a cable clutch. Again, we don't think actually Eli Tomac would have been too happy to resign if it went hydro. He's not a hydro guy. Uh, the bike is still cable clutch, but it's different style clutch. Instead of having 
coil springs on post five to six that we usually see on a lot of OEM bikes, they are going to a disc spring, um, which is very typical of kind of the, the diaphragm springs and stuff that we see in the KTM and in now the Kawasaki um, 450. So something similar to that has been integrated here. So gone are the posts. It's one big single disc spring. Um, it also integrates the primary gear into the basket into one single unit. Again, I believe that is a primarily a KTM thing. So you no longer have the gear pressed on or riveted. It is made one piece into that basket. Um, Overall, everything they've done here, they say, is to basically make the clutch a bit more compact in total size. So again, probably be able to shrink the size of the clutch cover in the cases, how it's recessed in there, and be able to just take away a little bit more weight from the engine cases. Uh, externally, the bike also has an all-new exhaust system. That means the head pipe, the exhaust can, all that has been changed to match and accentuate all the updates here um, on the engine. All the mapping has been revised, of course, for 23. We see that very commonly every time there's a major engine or exhaust change, the OEM maps are going to change, but they have also added things. Of course, Yamaha has been famous for having the Power Tuner program app for the past few years now, and they really give the consumer the most use of their bike stock, really being able to just mess around again with the fuel and uh, ignition points on their little map system. Yes, it's not as nearly as advanced as like Vortex ECU software or Get ECU software, but for anybody that doesn't just dyno bikes all day and is an engine builder, it's pretty hard to understand all the data points on this. This is a little bit more simply put out there. And then it does offer a good amount of change for these data points but it's not so extreme that the bike can be hurt. Basically, you can be an idiot and go to negative four on everything or plus four on everything. You can bring it to the ends of how the mapping works. It may not run fantastic, but it won't really hurt the bike. So Yamaha's done a good job of giving consumers a lot of power, the ability to tweak their machine and learn, but at the same time, not put themselves in danger where an aftermarket ECU, if you actually had the laptop program, you could punch some stuff and the bike probably won't even start. That's, <laughs> that's the big difference there. Um, big changes also in the electronics are we now have a launch control tuning system and traction control. Now, of course, everybody instantly usually misunderstands what OEMs mean by traction control in motocross. Traction control on a motocross bike is not like it is in a car or like race cars and stuff because we do not have front and rear wheel sensors. So we are not picking up rear wheel spin according to front wheel speed. Typically, the way they work in a dirt bike is it's more of a power reduction system that's based off of RPM spikes. So it might have a system that, example, it has three modes to the, to the traction control system. It doesn't give us the parameters in the release here. But to give you an example, it might be something where like when the throttle position is at 50% or under, so if you're quarter throttle, somewhere between zero and half throttle, the system might be engaged. Um, and if it sends an RPM spike that is unusual, it can relate that that RPM spike is probably because the rear tire is spinning and it will engage some sort of power modification. Um, typically these systems don't work at very wide open throttle inputs. That way it doesn't cut power if you're panic revving in the air or you're blitzing whoops with the throttle position high. That's just an example of how we've seen some of the systems work on Han and the Cow in the past, not to say those exact parameters are how Yamaha is doing it, but that's pretty typical of what we see. It's usually throttle position based on when the system is active and non-active. And then it is also based on RPM spikes and some other data of that nature it's able to bring in to try to estimate that there is real wheel spin since it doesn't actually have wheel speed sensors to match to pick that up. All this can be done on the fly by a new handlebar mounted switch as we're seeing with a lot of these bikes are getting more and more buttons on them so you can play with your which map you're in, which lot, if you have the traction control on, which traction control map you're in, are you arming the launch control, are you starting the bike, are you shutting it off, are you launching a missile to the moon, there's a lot of buttons to play with. <laughs> the interesting one I really like is the launch control system. So they have allowed you to set an RPM limiter on a launch control in 500 increment, increments between 6,000 and 11,000 RPM. So say you're a guy that's uh, I got a local track that's concrete starts and you want to set a nice low RPM so you don't accidentally spin the tire. You could set this thing at 6,500 or 7,000 RPM. So you press the button, no matter how hard you turn the throttle, it's going to hit that limiter and stop rising. So you can just sit there and make your starts a little more consistent. You could adjust it for dirt. Um, that's pretty cool because that's what, again, when these teams develop them, it's really precise on where the RPM location is. So it's you can basically 
repeat it makes repeatability of your starts easier so they're actually allowing you to modify that which is pretty interesting uh, the frame externally may not look much different i think it's a similar design style to what yamaha has used in the past but they say that it is basically a completely redesigned frame it consists of more than 10 different components that are welded together to create um, the chassis so again it looks like they're using a similar design character to what they've had so at this point they're just changing thicknesses and welding points to change rigidity and flex characteristics in certain points of the bike. The Yamaha is known as a bike that has a lot of built-in chassis comfort. It's maybe not as quick turn and responsive as say like a Honda or a Suzuki, but it's just typically way, way more comfortable, way more settled feeling. Um, as usual with this type of bike, if they're aiming for a lighter feel, a little bit more, um, a little bit more flickability, they may have tried to increase some rigidity in a few places to try to get more response out of chassis. But they also claim that they have, again, improved bump absorption and increased traction. So their goal is to, again, maximize each point of the chassis. Um, all PR speak. We'll see when we actually get to ride the bike how different it feels in that in that aspect. Again, the biggest thing we've heard from the one or two people we know that have ridden it is they said it feels lighter to ride. It feels more nimble. Um, leg grip points, one of the riders I know that rode it is on the fairly smaller side, not much bigger than me, I would, or I think might even be smaller than me in terms of height, probably under the 5'9 mark, 5'8 mark. And that was a big comment was about that rider connection, how much smaller the bike felt. I know they've really worked on the fuel tank placement is a big one. The way the fuel tank is set in and where, how it's measured in the frame to try to shrink up the frame in that area. Uh, suspension is still spring fork on this bike. As they've always stuck with KYB SSS system, uh, it does have some cool dial adjusters now up top that you typically see on the works forks just to be able to make some uh, changes on the fly for the compression side. And then all the body work on the bike, as everybody's trying to do, it's slimmer, it doesn't cover as much of certain areas in the bike, and then the certain areas it does have coverage just to try to increase the places that you uh, grip the motorcycle. Um, another comment is about the rider triangle, about them trying to increase leg room. So you probably have heard more and more is this YZ um, that last generation bike was around people trying lower pegs, taller seats, certain things to open up their legs because even me at somewhere around like five, eight, I, I actually enjoyed it with a little bit lower peg on it because the peg, your knees felt like they were almost up in your stomach. The seat to foot peg height was so small on the last bike. And then the bar reach was so far out. So they've tried to improve that rider triangle, which in my opinion, just that alone would definitely help make the bike feel lighter just based on the tests we've done on the last generation bike. Being able to open up your legs easier and be able to control the bikes more through your leg and not feel as crouched on the motorcycle really improves that aspect of things. A uh, big point of them being able to move the fuel tank is the air intake path, air box, and filter. As you can see, the filter almost looks like it's up in a little bit higher position up front. I think they've moved that air box more compacted so they've been able to Instead of the fuel tank being as boxy and square, it's a little more rectangular. The fuel seems to possibly be pushed farther forward in the bike a little bit. So they've been able to thin down the, again, the frame, thin down the radiator shroud area because of that air filter and that air box and try to finally, I think once and for all, eliminate that front fat feeling that people always tend to get when they jump on a YZ450 or YZ250F. Again, this year, the bike will be available in a standard Team Yamaha Blue, and it will also be in a Monster Energy Yamaha Racing Edition. The standard bike will be 9,899 MSRP, and the Monster Energy Race Edition will be $10,099, so an extra 200 bucks. They're not claiming that the standard blue bike will be here until November for USA dealers, but it does say the Monster Energy Edition will hopefully be available in October. Um, we believe on our end with media testing that we probably will not have our bikes till early October as well. We think that our bikes are coming over possibly on the same shipment as consumers. We don't think they're getting air freighted in any earlier. So sadly, it will still be, I would say, at least two months before we actually get to swing a leg over this thing and give you guys a riding impression. Uh, like I said, that's my best case scenario, I think, is early October. I would say at this time, it's really unlikely that we get to test one of these in September. Um, we've just asked the other day, and that's kind of where we're at. We don't have an exact date, but that was sort of the range we were given. So if you guys have any questions about the bike, any questions about the information, anything we can maybe expand upon, throw it in the comments section below. I'll see what I can do to answer it. Maybe I can even ask some development questions if some of the guys try to get us a little more info. Now that the bike exists, it's a lot easier to reach out to Yamaha and get answers, because before it's just been super vague. Um, they've done a really good job of keeping this bike quiet. 
We literally did not know anything about this until 9 a.m. this morning when they dropped the info to the public. They didn't send us out any pre-information, any pre-embargoes, nothing. They kept this one quiet. They did a great job of keeping photos non-existent, um, which is pretty rare these days that somebody didn't get a spy shot of this thing somewhere testing. Um, so again, if you have those questions, throw them in the comment section below. We'll do our best to try to come up with an answer. And if you want to read through all just the tech mumbo jumbo PR stuff, hit the link below. It'll take you to our website at biomex.com. Um, the link below will take you straight into that feature. You can check it out and also maybe wander around the site a little bit more. Um, thanks for watching. Hopefully we helped expand upon what Yamaha was doing here. And uh, later.